Alrighty, we're back, and we're continuing our discussion related to the atomic nature of matter. We had talked about the very, very early years with Democritus, Aristotle, um, Anton Lavoisier, and John Dalton. You should be familiar with those four names. We did talk about some others, but those four are the big names that we uh, included in the last video. The first model of the atom became known as the billiard ball model of the atom, proposed by John Mal Don Dalton. Remember, nothing could get smaller than the, uh, than the atom itself. So, continuing on with that discussion, um, in the very late 1800s, Joseph John Thompson came on the scene, and he did an experiment with a cathode ray tube. Now, I'm going to show you a video, a quick demonstration, related to what a cathode ray tube is and what subatomic, JJ, subatomic particle that J.J. Thompson discovered by using the cathode ray tube. So we'll go to that demonstration now. Hello, kiddos. Today we'll be looking at a cathode ray tube. This is the apparatus that J.J. Thompson used when he discovered the first subatomic particle. It's a pretty simple apparatus. It's a vacuum tube. So we have a glass tube and all of the air has been sucked out of it. It literally is a vacuum tube. When an electric current is applied to this tube, there's a beam of light that emanates from the cathode, thus the name cathode ray tube. And JJ experimented with these rays and he found that they were either deflected or attracted by a magnetic field. Let's take a look. Here's a small magnet, and when I bring it close to the cathode ray, you can see that one end of the magnet actually attracts those rays. And then when I turn the magnet over, the other end will actually repel those rays. Turns out that the end that's repelling, this right here, is the, the, the negative pole of the magnet. And of course, like charges repel, so he determined that the charge of those rays uh, were negative, carried a negative charge. He also found that these particles had a mass. He did a charge to mass ratio and calculated the approximate mass of these particles and he found that they were approximately 2,000 times smaller than a hydrogen atom, which is quite profound because the hydrogen atom is the smallest atom. And if we've just found a particle about 2,000 times smaller than a hydrogen atom, the smallest atom, we've just discovered our first subatomic particle. And of course, this became known as the electron. Thank you. Alrighty, welcome back. Uh, so he was credited with the discovery of the first subatomic particle called an electron. Remember it was about 2,000 times smaller than the smallest known atom at that time, hydrogen, so we had to have a subatomic particle. We usually abbreviate electron with a lowercase e and a negative sign after it. The lowercase e, of course, symbolizing the word electron, and the negative, of course, meaning that it carries a negative charge. Shortly after, Robert Millikan came on the scene with his famous oil drop experiment and obtained the first accurate measurement of an electron's charge. And with this, he was able to find the mass of an electron more accurately to be actually 1 1837th the mass of the lightest known element, hydrogen. Thompson again discovered a second a subatomic particle. Remember, we had negatively charged particles, the electron, and we know that matter is electrically neutral. So if we have negative particles, there must be something that carries a positive charge. And so Thompson searched for those, and he discovered that second subatomic particle. He found that they have the same amount of ch electric charge as an electron, except, of course, in an opposite direction. However, this charge is opposite in sign of an electron. These particles are called protons. Now the symbol for a proton is the lowercase p with a positive sign. Thompson calculated the mass of this second subatomic particle to be huge relative to the size of an electron. It's about 1836 times the size of an electron, or about the size of a hydrogen atom minus its electron. Interesting. 
So he proposed that all atoms were composed of protons and electrons. His model of the atom was kind of like Dalton's, this billiard ball thing, but the electrons were embedded within this positive substrate he called protons. This model became commonly known as the plum pudding model of the atom. So here would be Thomson's model where we have this uh, matter containing evenly distributed positive charges, the protons, and embedded within this positive charge were electrons. Now the reason it was called the plum pudding model is J.J. Thompson was British. And plum pudding, apparently in Britain, is sort of like a cake, nothing like a pudding we would expect here in the United States. But it's sort of like a cake or a bread, and embedded within that bread are tiny plums, or we might think of them as raisins. So it became known as the plum pudding model of the atom. So Dalton, we have the billiard ball model of the atom, and J.J. Thompson, that plum pudding model of the atom, which contains protons and electrons. Okay, moving right along. Ernest Rutherford. This was the next big leap in our knowledge of the atom. Ernest Rutherford is responsible for that. Under the direction of Rutherford, Hans Geiger and Ernest Marchton subjected a very thin sheet of gold foil to a stream of positively charged particles. Those were alpha particles. They found that most of the particles passed right through that very thin sheet of gold foil, just as Rutherford had expected they would. They are high energy particles, so he thought they would zip right through that thin piece of gold foil. Now something happened that Rutherford did not expect. From this, Rutherford concluded something about the atom. So before I fill in this blank right here, let me show you a drawing of the gold foil. And we're going, uh, the gold foil experiment. We'll try to explain what's happening here. This is a block made out of lead with a hole drilled in it. Inside that block of lead was a radioactive source that emitted a beam of alpha particles. Now remember, alpha particles carry a positive charge and they were directed at a thin piece of gold foil. On the opposite side of this gold foil was a screen made out of zinc sulfide. And zinc sulfide has a unique property in that it fluoresces or glows when it's struck by a piece of ionizing radiation, like an alpha particle. Now, Rutherford thought because of the energy that an alpha particle uh, carried, it would zip right through the gold foil and this part of the gold zinc sulfide screen would fluoresce. And that's pretty much what he observed. And he did this in a photographic uh, dark room where it was pitch black and he was looking through a magnifier, almost like a microscope, at this area of the zinc sulfide screen. His assistant said that they thought that they had seen flashes that were not directly across from the source, that they were deflected. And so Rutherford asked them to investigate further. And sure enough, every once in a while, there would be a flash of an alpha particle not where Rutherford had expected. And so Rutherford asked them to actually take their magnifier and direct it at the back side of this zinc sulfide screen. And sure enough, every once in a while, there would be a flash backwards. And Rutherford could not explain what caused these unexpected flashes. What would cause these alpha particles to be deflected? Using the Thompson model of the atom, remember the plum pudding model of the atom? It, 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 that shouldn't have happened at all. So he began to rethink the model of the atom and change the way in which we think of an atom. He proposed that the positive charge, these protons, were concentrated in a central region of the atom, and that was called the nucleus. So the nucleus was a positively charged uh, center, and it was massive uh, compared to the size of the electrons. The electrons, he proposed, were outside of that positive charge, orbiting in some manner, he really didn't know, around that positive charge. Now, if that were the case, what would happen if a positive alpha particle came close to that positive nucleus of the atom? Well, they'd begin to repel each other, and they would be deflected. What would happen if one came straight on and hit that nucleus dead center? Wouldn't it also be repelled? But this time it would come straight back towards the source, which is exactly what Rutherford observed along with his assistants. Now very few of these particles were deflected. 
Almost all of them went straight through. So what does that tell you about the distance between this nucleus and its nearest neighbor, maybe a nucleus up here? If almost all of them went through, doesn't it mean that there's a huge amount of space between nuclei? And remember, the nucleus makes up almost all of the mass of an atom. So if there's a huge space between nuclei, matter must be made of primarily empty space. In fact, if we made the nucleus the size of maybe a quarter and put that on the 50-yard line of a football field, the nearest electron would be about a half mile away orbiting the size of maybe a flea outside of that football stadium. So, if I had atoms um, that were making up my gold foil and I were shooting uh, alpha particles at them, what are the chances that an alpha particle would even come close to the nucleus of an atom and be deflected? Well, since there's a huge distance between them, the likelihood of that happen, happening was almost negligible. That's why almost all of those alpha particles went straight through. So, Rutherford concluded that the atom consists mainly of empty space. Rutherford was surprised that a few particles were deflected at large angles. And once again, some even bounced back in the opposite direction from which they were started. Rutherford was so surprised by this that he is quoted as saying that he was surpri as surprised as if it were a cannonball being deflected by a piece of tissue paper. Rutherford later concluded that this must have been the result of a very small core of positive charge protons were concentrated in that very, very tiny core, which he called the nucleus. So, you should know the name Ernest Rutherford. He's credited with the discovery of the atomic nucleus. All right, we'll continue on with this in the next video, talking about James Chadwick and the discovery of a third subatomic particle. Thanks for being with me. Bye-bye.